gonna mug me. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. This is not like a, a psychiatric unit at a general hospital where you would take your mother. Listen to me. Get out of the room! Get out of the room! You're Fuck yelling. you! I'm gonna You're hit yelling. you! I'm gonna hit you! You're yelling. I'm angry! Okay, she's yelling. Hang on, just to Richard. Turn the radio down. Okay, come but with me. Turn it. Shh. Just come with me to get. That's not going to help you. Come well, I'm fucking mad right now. Can we leave this he's room? He's telling me he's going to punch me. Can we leave? And he's this? telling me to leave. Justine. This room. What do you want me to do? He won't Justine? do anything. He's like, oh, he won't turn it down. Justine. He won't do anything. He's not telling me. You're to not turn listening it down. right now. You're yelling. You're yes, not I using am your rational. I'm very mad. You're not using your rational thinking. I need you to calm down. Walk with me so the guys can deal with him. Come with me. The Brockville Mental Health Center is strictly a forensic psychiatry unit, which means every client here has some sort of criminal charge. Well, then Just take listen. it away from them. I can't. You need to not yell right now. You're yelling at me. Well, take it away from them. They've then. stirred up a lot of emotion with the male patients, and the particular male believes that and is paranoid that the girls are yelling at him, they're problematic with him, they're causing him problems. So he was very agitated, very angry. It's not gonna help by yelling, okay? Well, he's yelling, no one's telling you. I've seen lots of violence over the years. Serious violence. We've had murders on this floor. Whenever she had asked me to speak to him, I did. And I said, Richard, in French, I said to him, please mm -hmm. turn down the radio. They're mm -hmm. trying to watch TV. And he did. did. It still wasn't good enough for her. No. She just, she was fixated on that. And she, she decided, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. And she did. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, she wasn't expecting the retaliation he was ready to give her. And no. I think he scared her. He did. She said, she said he scared her. But I, t I told her, and, I, and I've told her many times, I said, you're not on the on a unit where you don't think you're going to get hurt. I said that's your first mistake because on this unit it could happen very. My biggest concern is that she removes herself from the situation when it escalates like that. The majority of people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, they don't have violent tendencies. But all our patients at some point displayed violence. They're stable, they're fine, but the potential for violence is what got them here in the first place, not just because they were schizophrenic, because they were violent.
Michael's a very warm, intelligent young man struggling with a devastating illness, which is schizophrenia. We have been able to get him quite well, but never into recovery. Essentially what's been going on with Michael is that he has become quite sensitive in social situations. It's not really paranoia in the sense that you think somebody's going to harm you. It goes back to he has a feeling that people know what he did. As a new patient, generally speaking, they'll put you up, they'll start you up on the fourth floor. It's like, it's like school. B3 North, B4 South is grade one. B3 North is B2, or is grade two. Down here South is three, and what I'm on is four, and you want to get out of here. This is the most secure unit of the four in the FTU. They're pretty caged in for the for the time being. They could come in on a on a serious crime. The staff wants to know if they're if anything else. They don't want anything else to happen. Anything else negative. They're strangers to each other too, so. There's, there's a threat that exists between co-patients, just as there's a threat between the staff and the patient, patients at times. So it's, it can be a hostile area. Have you got a blanket? No. You want a seclusion blanket? These are our most dangerous, most unpredictable fellows at this end. We're going to get some more guys up before we open that door. I don't think he even knows where he is no, at all. I don't think he knows what's even going on. Most of them are, are new people that we don't know that well, and they haven't been stabilized on meds. But he's very unpredictable. Very, very ill. Okay. He's just very sick. Could be very frightening if you weren't psychotic. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to come in and you're in for an assessment and you aren't floridly psychotic, I imagine it would be just a, a very frightening visit to the circus. And then over here we have the nursing station, the care station. There are a lot of patients to take care of and we have lots of needs. Things seem to be pretty quiet right now, so we're, I don't know, the patients, everyone's behaving themselves for the most part. If, if someone is, causes trouble, the first thing they'll do is they'll close this, this, this door here, thus barricading themselves into the nursing station if, if, if worse comes to worse. Tell me about this program group. What do you take in it? The one I just finished was called Symptom Management. Do they talk to you about if your voices return, how to handle that? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. And what do they teach you about that? They ask you, does it sound like it's a person talking to you or does it sound like it's in your head? And you answer, no, I think it's the person talking to me or whatever. They ask you uh, what, what they say, the voices say. And you tell them they say, I hate you, or I love you, or whatever they say, you know? Can you tell the difference when the voices are real and when they're not real? No, well, I know my sister is here. I can, I can tell. I know my sister, sister's temper. You know your sister's and, here? And, and it scares me because I know she. She, she, she thinks I'm a loser. Okay, but is your sister here? No, she's not. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure. Okay. Do you see her anywhere around? No, but, but I hear, hear her voice. Okay. I recognize but, it. So I, can you tell that those voices aren't real? No, you can't. 
that's when you need to come to staff. Okay. Okay? Okay. Because if your sister's not around, any voices that you hear are voices that you're hearing in your head. Okay. This is Curie. This, this is in Germany. This is Brockville. Eh? Yes, it's Brockville, Ontario, it's Canada. The pe people keep telling me it's Germany, and what I people? never studied. And what people? My sister. But your sister's not here. It feels like she's here. I know my sister's done for my sister. My, my, my sister would get really, really angry at me. Like, it's all part of the voices that tell you things? Yeah. Now those are not what they call command hallucination. Command hallucinations are something different? Yes. What are they? Command hallucinations, from what I gather, are things that say, um, jump off this bridge. It's right there, look, look, there's the railing. <laughs> jump off this bridge. There's a bridge there, and it's quite, quite elevated over the highway, and on the highway there's huge, huge vehicles passing, right? So you're walking across the bridge, and the voice will say, now's a good time, now's a good time. So <laughs> the, that's what a command hallucination is, I think. Aside from harming yourself, uh, as you understand it, do command hallucinations ever tell you to hurt somebody else? I'm certain they do. Mr. Beninato was diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1996, and this followed a series of violent outbursts against his family and reports of hearing voices. This leads up to the 2003 incident. On that particular day, he came home. Uh, his father was watching television, and he asked his mother for a cigarette. Uh, she said she didn't have one. He escalated and became very, very angry and grabbed her by the hair and was shaking her around. As a result of that, she became unconscious. He called an ambulance and said that he had a temper tantrum, as he put it. And she was brought to the hospital. She was in the intensive care unit because she was in a coma for weeks and uh, suffered irreversible neurological damage, walks with a cane. Sometimes patients feel that the more honest they are about symptoms, the less privileges they'll get, because then people think they're sicker and they're more of a risk. So in Mr. Beninato's case in particular, he sometimes downplays that to say that he experiences them all the time, and especially if he says, well, they told me to do bad things, that probably he wouldn't get out of the hospital as quick as he, as he would like. I don't hear a voice. I don't even know why I give me medication. I, but they tell me I'm, I, I got schizophrenia, I'm mentally ill, I'm sick. So I just listen to them, you know? And have you ever heard voices? Um, no, not really, no. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really hear voices. Sometimes I think through my thoughts and stuff. Um, sometimes I do hear voices, so yeah. I don't really like uh, hear them too much. I think like the voices are like voices saying, oh, who cares, buy crack cocaine, buy marijuana, drink beer, liquor, whatever. And then, um, then my thoughts say, hey, like you don't want to do that. And then even the voices that say buy crack cocaine, they're, they, you know what they say? They say, we're sorry we, 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 we bothered you when we bothered you in the past. And then they start to say things like, or uh, um, well, the thoughts say things like, don't like listen and don't go buying the drugs. And even the voices say we don't want we don't want to pressure you into doing that either. You know, sometimes like uh, I'm not saying right now, but in the past, like the the staff heard you like yelling in your room and there's no one yeah, else there. Yeah, yeah. So wh how would you explain that? It's sort of like I hear like voices bugging me or like putting me down. So you yell back at them? Is that is that what you're doing? Well, it's like I'm not trying to put the voices down, you know. You know, instead of saying, hey, like, uh, leave me alone, I was just like, I tell them, like, you know, like, why don't you, like, start to get with the program? You're falling behind, you know? Mm -hmm. Lunch is now on the ward for the south side. Lunch is now on the ward. You want this now?
Hey, Mike. Hey, Peter. How are you? Not too bad, you? Good to see you. I'm good. Good to you. Thanks. Hey. Johnny. Looks like you got some salmon. More than me. Maybe. How you doing? The name of this person is Michael Roland Stewart. His date of birth is December 14th, 1978. His date of admission was March 22nd, 2005. His index offense is second degree murder. Legal status is not criminally responsible, NCR. Mike belonged to what would normally be considered the popular crowd. He was extremely self-assured, extremely confident. Um, top marks in the class. Lots of friends, girls and guys. He's probably among the funnier sure. people in the room, I think. But he was very, just so sharp, such a, a good way with words, you know, supremely confident. And this was certainly into the time where Mike had become sick. Spring of 1997. There seemed to be a difference in him right away, and I thought that he kind of became quite recluse. He thought Mom had awoken him so she could read his mind a few hours before he went to school. Do you see a big change in him today? Oh, he's not the same guy at all. From a nursing perspective, Mike is making slow, steady improvement, but some negative symptoms remain. His overall mood is good, but quiet. He spends a lot of his leisure time in the TV lounge, but does not socialize much with co-patients. He usually maintains a quiet demeanor about the ward. Yep, I just got the floor. Yeah. Okay, guys. Come on, Hort. Hey, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I think my knee can take it. I'm going to bowl today. What do you think, Mike? Can Could you help me? Well, I don't know if I can help you, but I hope you'll do fine. Bye, Bia. <laughs> You're going to beat your best score today? That's the goal. Uh, I, 110. 110? He's always struggled with the social aspect of the hospital, so he he seems to do better with staff. To hang around with his peers, I don't think he's he's ever been very good at that. He has become quite sensitive in social situations. He, for example, has turned down the opportunity to go into the community on his own, even though he's probably well enough to do that. By being sensitive to people around him, that they may know what he did 10 years or so ago. So that type of hypersensitivity, hypervigilance is what's been bothering him.
The next person we're going to conference today is uh, Carol. Then this is the upstream. Carol is a 39 year old female. This is what I call my imaginary friend. Carol was found in CR on account of mental disorder on two charges of assaulting a police officer and four charges of assault on September 20th, 2010. Head up. Carol has been estranged from her family. There are no next of kin noted in her clinical chart. She became a ward of the Children's Aid Society at the age of 11 years. When you work, you gotta get up early, get showered, have to look appropriate for your job, you know, have dress in your best. From what I understand from her past, she would become very upset. She'd run into traffic. She was admitted to the hospital. She was discharged back to her apartment. An ACT team worker came to visit. She didn't want the ACT team worker to leave. And she threatened to commit suicide, is my understanding. And as the ACT team worker was leaving, she jumped off a balcony. And that's how she uh, got a lot of the orthopedic injuries that you see when she walks. The stickers are for good behavior, and it tells you that if you get 14 stickers in a row without missing one, you get to order or you can save your money for whatever you wish to buy. And if you don't, if you, I miss one stickable here, so I don't get one. But here, I had a perfect month, and over, over here, I had a perfect month. So that's about it. Out of, out of all, and this is April. That's me. So when you say bad behavior, what do you mean by that? Yelling at staff, or refusing to take my pills, or refusing to go to my room when I'm when I'm upset, or getting into a fight with people. Getting to into an argument, I don't get a sticker. And are, are you a bad girl often? Yeah. <laughs> That's hard for me to get to actually have all my stickers. Bad behavior gets me in trouble. I find it hard to be good. You find it hard to be good? Yeah. And how are you doing so far this month? Uh, well, I'm off to a rocky start. <laughs> Can you give me a sense of how many of the patients here are capable of serious violence? Absolutely all of them. Every one. Every single one. Every single one. Of them. Carol Seguin? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Carol is one of those people that there is no question. Once she, once she started point, to yeah. be a problem, you had to get out the five point yeah. restraints because if she couldn't get at you to hurt you, she would start smashing her skull on the wall. And you know within a few minutes of locking her, she's going to start whacking her head off the toilet or the, usually the cement walls. You had to, you couldn't listen to that. It was just awful. Awful females. They're the worst. I'm sorry, they are. I didn't say that. <laughs> They're just, of course you didn't. <laughs> I jumped on it. <laughs> <laughs> Women make the worst patients. Oh, absolutely. And it's just, oh, absolutely. I, I agree. There, there is no explaining how or why. It's just that way. <laughs> 59 patients here at the forensic treatment unit and about five female patients is quite a difference. The men tend to cause more violent crimes on the outside, on the outside world, and the women tend to cause more uh, violence on the inside. I mean, I'm not used to wrestling with people. I never thought in my lifetime that I would be in this field where I'm wrestling with some female on the floor because she's just taken a swing at me or tried to kick me in the stomach or did kick me, and now we're into a whole different ball of wax. I've wrestled with probably more women here than I ever will with men. I do believe that, that some of it can be attributed to their illness. 
they're extremely vulnerable. I know, I know, Angela, but I don't know if it's fixed, eh? The guys will know. Yeah. Historically, women coming in have some sort of mood disorder. So they're bipolar or they're schizoaffective, which is all related to mood fluctuations. So yeah, something that simple causes chaos on the unit. <laughs> Just another day in the neighborhood. How you doing? Hi, Mike. Hi, How you doing? Hi. Michael, haircut? Michael, yeah. Looking good? Yeah. How you doing? Mm, doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to dip in? Go for it. When's the last time you had muscles, Michael? The last time I had muscles? Mm-hmm. Jeez, I don't... I don't remember. Really? Two RCMP pulled up and uh, asked us, is one of you Rebecca Stewart? I thought that Michael had, had killed himself because again, that was always the, the concern. And he just said to call your dad. Dad picked up and said, hello. I said, hello. I said, what's going on? He said, something very bad has happened. Um, and I said, Michael's killed himself. And he said, no. Uh, Michael has killed your mother. And then I was caught off guard. And I said no, and he said yes. And then I think I said no again. And I was worked up, so I asked if I could call him back in a few minutes, get off the phone and call him back. He said I could do so, and then we hung up, and then I just started smashing the receiver, the phone receiver into the phone, and kind of realized that I was in a public spot. So I went outside and just went for a little walk. And that was it. That's always good. Yeah, either way, I'm happy. <laughs> He apparently arrived at his parents' home in the early afternoon and waited in the house until his mother, the victim, arrived home between 3.30 and 3.45 p.m. He was reported to have confronted his mother and then an altercation developed between the two. She eventually died from severe blunt trauma to the head. She was uh, a nurse who uh, loved her profession and uh, a community uh, member who loved her community and a mother who loved her family. Good morning, here we are in Tommy Donahue's farm up in Douglas, Ontario. As you can see, well it's Friday morning, September the 7th, the year 2001, and the sun has just come up, and you can see the mist through the uh, real fencing, and of course the cattle. So, what a perfect day. You both look pretty pleased in that picture. Mm -hmm. It's a cute photo. It's June and me. I'm not. We're going out somewhere because we're June's. We're dressed for an, an evening out. Pretty loud outfit. Uh, Mum's right. Yeah, which yeah. is typical. Fairly standard. Yeah. She was a fashionista mm -hmm. in her own right. I think. 
she like to dress up? I don't think I've ever I've, seen that I've picture. I've never seen that either. It's beautiful. It's a photograph of mom I've not seen before. And it's, it's nice. It's a great picture. It looks pretty pensive. What had Mike's relationship with her been like before? She loved him very much, and uh, and he loved her very much too. And I think that uh, where he needed very occasional emotional support, he he got it in spades from her. You know, a mother who, for years after Michael became sick, would cry herself to sleep at a concern for him, and he knew that when he was well enough to know that. What kind of thoughts are you having right now? I want to kill myself. Okay. I want to hang myself. Okay. Carol, <laughs> you know us? Yeah, I know and, you. And we know you? Yeah, I know. And we know you, that you're a good person, right? Right. Okay. And, and we're here to take care of you. Right. And we're here to keep you safe. I know that, so but that's, I don't feel loved. Well, we're going to keep you safe. Okay. What, what we're going to do yeah. is what I want to do is I'd like to help you with those thoughts because you're having really bad thoughts right now. Yeah. And those thoughts right now are telling you that you're a bad person, that you've done things, okay? Right. Which you haven't, right? They're talking about me on the TV. Those are the, but that's your, your, your delusional thinking, right? Right. Those are, the, those are those thoughts that you have in your mind that you know aren't real but that are so overwhelming to you that you can't deal with them that they're very very frustrating and anxiety provoking for you right right i feel people are talking about my back yeah. and all that yeah and it, it's it's that over they, that they hate me yeah but people don't hate you here you know we've we've treated you well and that you've done well and that i'm trying my yeah. best but it's been like a You're month just, since you know I'm what carol <laughs> carol <laughs> carol you're just having a bad day right Everybody's, listen, everybody's allowed to have a bad day. It's okay. Oh, no, it's okay. Stuart is my last name. Mike is my, Mike is my first name. And uh, my room is, I'll let you see my room here. It's not in great order, but it's its in order. Okay, you need to do a walkabout? I need to do a walkabout. Okay, let's oh, there go. there he is. I have this thing here, is my privacy, uh, my privacy uh, curtain. Um, it's mainly be used at nighttime because they can walk by. Oh, he's in his bed. That's great, you know. But uh, at any time, any passing person can take a peek in. So you just have to understand that uh, the privacy is it's pretty good, but just be, you know, be decent.
what we're supposed to do now is mark down on here what each individual was doing, where they were, and what they were doing at that specific time. My impression is that the family's still somewhat fearful about him because of the, the past. And he has a history of violence against his parents, so it's not just the parents, there are siblings too. And I really don't think they'd want him at any point living back in their house. A lot of people want to be with their family and you don't want to hear that they don't want you back or they're fearful of you. <laughs> On the street I have friends, you know, like friend, you know what I mean? Like I, I just missed that. Nobody, like, no, not nobody talks to me. The staff doesn't talk to me. The patients don't talk to me. Nobody talks to me, you know? I don't know why are these people talking to me. And um, I don't know. I just don't know what to, uh, what to do, you know? I go and talk to them then, you know? You know, you want to have a coffee, you want to, you know, this and that, go for a coffee in the community, or you want to go for a smoke or something. It's hard to get a old boy. I'm not going out, no. Yeah, before, like, I have this friend, I have this friend here, and we would always talk and go for a smoke, and I lend him money, and we walk around, and we'll go to the benches and smoke. And lately, he hasn't been coming out and talking to me. Greg, where are you going, Greg? So you want to talk, stand out here and talk to me a bit, or are you going to go in there? Mm -hmm. I can't go in there, man. <laughs> you would always tell me, ever since I got here, you're my best friend, you're my best friend. And now I don't know what to do, you know? Like, I don't worry. Like, he never just comes and sits down, has a smoke, and talk to me no more. But other people I talk to, then you talk to, like I talk to them for a little bit, then all of a sudden they start staying alone, right? I want to get a necklace too. I don't got a necklace. Watch. I got a watch. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. Later, Ben. I, I was a little bit depressed at first, but when I started going to the gym, I felt better because, you know, it made me feel better about myself. So I guess that was a big help, or it is a big help, still going now, so. deal with the, the situation the way that she feels we should, it gets ramped up to the next degree. I know, but I'm not, am I doing something no. wrong? Get those children the fuck out of here, I mean. Put them downstairs and get over there. I don't, I don't, I, they're not my type. But he said this way here. Too. So just stay away with them for now and then we'll, we'll see. Well, do not come near me. She just went, it made me cry for it. I'm going mad for it. Yeah, I'm going fucking mad. 
Oh, for your man. What, what was what was going on? Uh, Dr. Gray and Sherry came to talk to us about Al because he's upset that there's females on the unit. Those girls are sick. Somebody else is fucking problem. I don't want your fucking problem. Yeah, you know, I have my own fucking problem. Al, yeah, if I yeah. talk to them and, and keep talking to them to stay away from you, can you guarantee me you're not going to hit one of them? I didn't hit them. No, I know you did. No, you did. My ear, well, you did. You, know? you did really well, but I don't want to see you hit one of them. <laughs> She's very attention-seeking, very... Uh, if she doesn't get the attention she wants, she can be very self-abusive. The room number. Mm -hmm. Hey, Nancy. Yeah? These have been in for a week. Do you think you can take them out? Which one's that one? These ones. They've been in for eight days. They're mm -hmm. only supposed to be in for a week. Sometimes uh, I do things to get an adrenaline rush. Um like cut myself. Well, frankly, we're quite concerned about her and her recent uh, self-harm attempts. Um, she would come to us and say she really doesn't feel well. We'll ask her, again, what, well, you don't feel well? She feels like cutting herself. She's told us she, she craves this. It's like an addiction, and she just had a, has to satisfy this. And she'll keep wanting to do it until she actually does it. And then she's, we've had four different cutting episodes, quite uh, deep uh, gashes on the arm. Boy, you sure, you sure hurt yourself, eh? I didn't do it as deep this time. Mm-hmm. That one was a bad one. Wow. Lots of stitches there. So deep, in fact, that like it's way below the, the skin layer and below the fat layer and down to the muscle la layer. And is that serious, serious? Is that a serious attempt? Or was, I mean, some people I know. I just hurt myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why do you think you do that? Mm -hmm. mm. Feels good sometimes. I have borderline personality disorder and hypochondriac. I don't know what the proper term is for it, but. What is borderline personality disorder exactly? It's a behavioral difficulties. They take a, they take a lot of risks and stuff like that. And... Now, some people say that every branch of medicine has its fatal disease. And for psychiatry, some people figure that borderline personality is the fatal disease. What does that mean? Untreatable. I lit fire downstairs because um, I was mad at a staff, so that was pretty impulsive. I lit fire to my um, pillow. Please come to the med room for your meds. Meds at the medicine room. Step right up, sir. Generally, there will be four times a day they will dispense medication. Well, one of the things I take is clozapine, and it's, it's an antipsychotic. If I stop taking it, there's a very good chance that some of the big problems that I used to have coping with my illness could very well return. You just <laughs> And it's, they tell me that each relapse you suffer does, does additional damage to, to your, I guess, your, your brain. The thing about medications are we have a legal right to refuse. Like if, 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 you, if you decide that the medication isn't working for you or that, uh, that it's, it's harming you, perhaps, you are legally entitled to do that. Also, there are people that will take the pills and, and uh, just keep them under their tongue. They swallow the water and then they'll turn and they'll spit the, the pills away. If patients are refusing medication and they start to uh, 
decline in their functioning and in their wellness, then uh, I, some of the older methods of coping with mental patients comes into play. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm he had a pig, E-I-E-I-O. There's an oink oink here, an oink oink there, here an oink here, boy, an oink oink, old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. I remember when she came here in 2005, she was like a wild animal. And she was in five point restraints because she was so wild and out of control. And in two years, she was stabilized and she was the best that we could possibly do with her. Her risk was low enough to get her back out in the community. And we had high hopes for her. I really miss you. I'm going to go. What happened to you? Uh, how are you? I'll tell you, I've seen Carol at her best. And if she's encouraged, it's very encouraging for me and the other staff to see how she does. I'm good. Oh, are you OK? I'm good. Hey, Carol. Hey. She can be kind. She can come up and give you compliments. Yeah, well, that's fine, right? <laughs> but on the flip side of that, 10 minutes later, she'll come up and call you a cocksucker and say she hopes that your kids die and she hopes that, you know, you crash your car on the way home. I remember one morning she came up to me it was about five o'clock in the morning and she called me a cocksucker and hated me and she was kicking out the door and punching at the door and as she walked away she said uh, you raped me you raped me you came into my room at night and raped me so i reported that documented it and i thought that it might not go any further than that but it did. She talked to Dr. James, and it was investigated further. Well, what I heard is you went running down the hallways yelling, rape, rape, he raped me. And I said that? That's what I heard. Mm-hmm. You know, it has to be investigated because these people are vulnerable, and things like that sometimes do happen, and they've happened in the past. I didn't say that, though. OK. Well, that, that's what I had heard. And with the way things are in society, it can really put staff, especially male staff, in a really difficult position. No, oh, I never said yeah. that. OK. I think you heard wrong. Maybe okay. I said something different, but I didn't say that. OK. Well, I'll look back in the, in the chart as well, but that's no, what I heard. You could have heard somebody else's voice. It sounded like me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I never said he raped me. OK. Never, I swear to God, I almost forgot okay. to shake your hand on it. Okay. <laughs> Did you ever come down here aside from visits, Mike? Um, not really. Following this attack on the mother, Mr. Stewart then called 911 at about 4.05 p.m. He was found in the house when the police arrived. He was then arrested escorted out of the house and transported to the Renfrew OPP office. He remains reluctant to discuss this in detail as he reports that he finds the whole incident difficult to discuss at this time. Do you ever talk with family about what happened? We talk about other things. Yeah, it's the hypersensitivity to social situations. So he stays with staff, he's worried about going into 
the community because he thinks people know who he is and what happened. How do we get him past that? How do yeah. we get him, who do we have in our team that can get him? I don't think he wants to talk about it. I mean, you got to be, I don't want to stir up something that's, you know, that's not going to, you know, I mean, I think for the moment it's, I think just let's leave it and see where he goes with it. Okay. Okay, I'm ready to make a confession. And that confession is that I, uh, I kind of lied when I said that I, that, that Margaret, that I didn't say that Margaret, that Margaret raped me because I did say that Margaret raped me, but I didn't remember having had said that. Did Mr. Earl ever touch you inappropriately or rape you? No. It was all in my mind. It was voice. Mm -hmm. I do believe that the, that the female patients here do cause more turmoil. They can be quite aggressive in their acting out, banging on walls, actually putting holes in walls too. It's it's incredible to imagine that, that a female patient could do that, but it really does happen. Who did that? That would be Carol. <laughs> I used the palm of my, the ball of my hand to smuck right into the wall. And I went like that, and I went with force until I, until I um, punched the wall about that deep. And that went through the wall. And people were, were a little bit scared of me. This is hole number one. Hole number two. And hole number three. And hole number four. And did you injure yourself? No. Your hand didn't hurt after punching four holes? It stung a bit, but uh, I didn't hurt myself. I didn't cut myself or anything. But Carol, yeah, she, she's, she's outstanding for, for putting holes through walls. We don't quite know how she had the strength to do it, but somehow she did. Have you ever seriously injured anybody? Not seriously, no. What's the, what's the worst that you've done in your face? It gives them a black eye. That's the worst physical injury you've inflicted on anybody? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, they're cans? I ordered bottles. I ordered bottles. I ordered bottles. She was the most challenging patient by far, um, considered by all the staff. <laughs> Me and Ashley Smith. Uh, I like to tie strings around our neck, uh, mostly to probably catch the attention of staff. We were also really concerned about uh, a recent incident where she'd torn up a face cloth and tied it together to make herself a ligature, tied it tightly around her neck and tried to strangle herself. She was, when staff found her on the floor in the shower room, she was, she was blue and, and not responding to us, to our verbal commands. So we called the code blue, as we call it here in the hospital, and staff ran and we brought a noose cutter to that area and they used it to cut the ligature off her neck. After that was removed, the color started to return to her face, and she started to respond. So we just thought it was a close call. Then we're always watching for the next time. It was mostly because when you tie a string around your neck, you get uh, really dizzy, and uh, the feeling of being passed out f feels good. It's like a, almost like a high. And that's what I was looking for, is that 
that feeling that you get when you almost die. I, I like that feeling. We did save her life. We did save her life. Yeah. You know, we know that it's all a matter of time with these, these strangulation attempts and so on. Sometimes it's just in a matter of time if we save them or not. You're the fastest smoker I've ever seen in my life. Well, I saw one Montreal even a lot faster than me. John, one of my friends, he used to smoke like that. <laughs> At least you don't waste a cigarette that way. How did it start with you and Sal? I, I, I was attracted to him at first. That he was a good looking, handsome guy and that he was a gentleman. I, I didn't know him very well, but he would go like that, put my, put my hair, put my hair over my, over my ear like that. He'd go like that, sort of mess up my hair. And then he asked me if I wanted to go out with him. What about girls? You had a young a relationship with a young lady here? I am have to have a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. That's Carol. Carol. It's an open secret that there is sexual activity between some of the patients. Uh, the patients are not allowed in each other's rooms. No. Where does this activity happen? <laughs> <laughs> we both have the same reaction. Everywhere, Everywhere else. and anywhere, and unbeknownst to us, we try not to catch them. It's, no. We can't allow it on the ward. When's your birthday? November. November? Yeah. Shaved your head. Yeah, you like it? Yeah, it looks good. Nice. Now, we don't yeah. encourage it but we realize it's going to happen. I mean, once people have access to the community and have freedom, or even freedom to go on the grounds indirectly supervised, you know, there's lots of opportunities for some kind of sexual engagement. Well, are they behind a hedge or something? You know, no, in the middle of the lawn. Behind a hedge is considered discreet. Come here. <laughs> oh, yeah. We've had patients doing on the ward that we didn't know about till the bed broke. <laughs> It's to God, it's like, bang, uh-oh. Sun's shining today. My baby's looking at me. And I'm looking at him right now. Making him smile. Making him laugh and giggle. Just like a jigsaw puzzle. This song I made up, so don't get me wrong. I know my own song, if you know what I mean. You're the one for me. Oh, yeah, for sure. He knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, music is a wonderful thing. You know, it's just a form of expression. Anyways, I'm going in, it's too cold.
it's not unusual in schizophrenia for people to have ambivalence. So what happens, people have a certain level of comfort, they're willing to do something, and then they become ambivalent and they withdraw again. We were talking, uh, Mike, about, uh, you know, not right now, but looking down the road maybe in a few months or that, possible uh, community placement options. Now, we're lucky with your disposition that we have all options open. You know, anywhere from group home to independent living to co-op. Is that something you'd be ready for in the next couple of months, do you think? Well, I, I don't... I, 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 I just like to... Well, it's hard to say. I, 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 uh, I... How about... You know what? In a couple of weeks, we go out and look at the co-ops. A couple of weeks? Yeah. Just to look. Not to move in, nothing like that. Or if you want, we could do it next month. I'll well, get a car. I, I just, I don't know why we, we're going so quick. I wanted to be my girlfriend to Justine. You know who Justine is? Hmm? She wanted to be my girlfriend too. You dated Sal for a while? Me? Uh, we didn't really date. We just kind of, it was just kind of a fling. Did Carol find out about it? I don't, I don't think so, no. I didn't get it at 11. I'm telling you, I didn't get it at 11. I don't want a girlfriend. It's just the girls asking me they want to be my girlfriend. So it's okay, but I didn't I didn't do anything lately, no. Yeah, I don't like her. No, do you? I don't like her. I don't know. I don't really care about her, but I used to I like her a little bit, yeah. I used to buy coffees off her dollar of coffee. She used to give me cream, sugar, and coffee. You remember Judy Punch uh just skin in the head? <laughs> Judy punched me in the head three times and then she got put upstairs. <laughs> I did call the police on her when she punched me. <clears throat> and they said she's here for life. There's nothing really we can do. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like her, you know? She's a rat freak. Right. You're a good guy, you know, and I like you. And you're one of the best boyfriends I've ever had. That's cool. Thanks. Wanna go for smoke? Smoke. <laughs> like it. it was Carol who was jealous because I was saying hi to Sal. And uh, she's like, you know that's my boyfriend, right? And you need to keep your hands and your mouth and your face away from him, or I'll punch you. Oh, okay. Didn't know you owned him. May I kiss? Thank you. Oh, it's still on the ass. And if I, if I understand you were worried about going home, you felt sort of sensitive, so you made a choice not to go home this Christmas, is that right? Yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Okay. The, the, the visit, I'm just, it would, uh, right. it would be troublesome and somewhat, uh, right. s s like I just. Right. I think he suffers every day from the loss of his life, the life that he could have had. And I, uh, he doesn't speak of it much, but he has spoken of it from time to time. So, so uh, I've made strides, but I, I want to make it so I'm, I can, I can like hold down a, a, a start with hold down some kind of a job, and then. 
see, see, if, see if I can uh, try to salvage something here of my life because I'm, uh, I'm a little old for uh, college or university. How old are you? I'm 33 years old. So that leaves me with a def another option, right? I can get work. Now, I think for someone with my limited qualifications, it might have to be in something like retail to start. I know that it's there with him. He would like to have a life. Carol, you've been here quite a while. Yeah. And you get along well with the females that are on the unit, all the women? Well, sometimes I get jealous because there's one person we all know who, who tried to steal my boyfriend. That was, you know, I was ready to push her down the stairs. Oh, dear. OK. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's quite extreme, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that person said, what's your problem? I went like that, and I, yeah. I almost punched her, and she got up and tried to punch me. She slipped the table and got me right in, in the midsection. Oh, OK. And you that's why that table is kind of wobbly, you know what I mean? Yeah. Is it um, harder for a woman bad. here? Yes, it's much harder for a woman. Why is that? Because there's so many guys who are on the hormones are racing. Mm -hmm. so whenever I'm close to my due date for my injection, my hormones have already gotten the get go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, in general, you got along well with all the females? Except for one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One day he just said, I'm ready and I want to go into the community and that then gave us the, the reason to go ahead. I have recently got the privilege where I can go into the community unescorted, but I have to fill out an itinerary. Okay, thank you. Detailing where I'm going, what streets I'm taking, uh, and the different times I'll be at the different landmarks. It's supposed to be down, almost down to the minute. Uh, there you go, bud. Okay, thanks, Bob. All right, we'll see you in a bit. Yep. doesn't have to have any supervision, doesn't have to report to anyone, doesn't have to uh, maintain his medication, doesn't have to, uh, free as you or I. And what do you think of that? Well, um, sp I'm speaking of Michael now when I say that I don't think he should ever have an absolute discharge. I think he should have lots and lots of liberty, but almost all sufferers go off their medication. He gets ill quite quickly. So in his case at least, uh, I don't think that, that an absolute discharge should ever be, uh, be available to him. Female patients here, all of them just want to be an ordinary woman. They still want to get married and, and have children and have a house and they have the same dreams and aspirations and for some reason they're all of a sudden put into this position where everything stops, their whole life and their, their dreams change.
Well, I have two girls. One's nine and one's seven, Jasmine and Angelique. I had them when I was younger, and I was in an abusive relationship, so they took my kids from me. And you had a third child? Yes, but he died of Zell Wagner's. But that's a different father. I had a, a cross that had Alex's ashes in it. And it was a necklace, and it was always kept close to my heart so that I, he would always be with me. I would show it to you, but I got into a fight the other day. And she just ripped it off my neck and said, there, bitch, now you can suffer. It's my favorite river. His name is Sam. Sam. I named them that. So I always want a wonder boy and my boy died at birth. So I thought uh, if they gave me a rug to tell you bear, that maybe it would take the pain away. So he's been a, even though he's not real, he still helped me. I still snuggle him and go and hug him and kiss him. Like he was an actual boy. It's like the Pinocchio story, the boy becomes real. The wooden doll becomes a, a real little real little boy because he stops to, uh, he learns to stop lying. <laughs> And the boy that the 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 one that had Pinocchio as a as like a dog friend always believed that he was real, and he uh, he did become real in the end. But I don't know. He'll never become real. But he's still my baby. People suffering from schizophrenia and major depression with psychosis kill family members. Once they recover, they then realize that they've done this terrible, terrible thing. He still hasn't forgiven himself. I mean, I see him every week or two. I struggle with he knows intellectually that he was mentally ill at the time. He has never, ever forgiven himself. It compounds his, his sorrow when he knows that we've lost our mom uh, at his hands as well. One can only imagine the horror that he experiences in those moments when he allows himself to recall that day. And I don't know what would be worse, whether the days when he's perfectly lucid are, are more painful for him to, to endure or the days when he's, when he's not well. But uh, I, I can only imagine that it's a, it's a living hell every single day and uh, some days are worse than others.
let me just ask you before we continue. Are you okay? Um, I think I'm fine, yeah. Okay, well, you, you'll say so. If you need to stop, if you want to stop it, it's okay. It's cool, man. Okay. Okay? Okay. Okay, this is, this is amazing. I didn't expect you to go this far. So if, if it's troubling to you, if it's upsetting to you, you can say that's enough for today type of thing. Okay? Right, we can proceed. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, it was foggy in the beginning. Um, I, uh, I had trouble accepting my, uh, my, uh, diagnosis. And, uh, I, at, there was a time when, uh, I, I had, uh, things were all well with basically anyone that I knew. I, I, I didn't really have enemies. And then, um, and I never really, so I didn't have any enemies. So why, why would I, why would I do something like this to someone that, that, uh, I, it's, 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 uh, like right after, like the, we're talking days, I was, I was calling them and asking for forgiveness days. Like, it would be weird because like, um, I would, if I, if I was feeling particularly bad, I would call my dad or my sister or something like that. And uh, and I would say, I would just say, oh, I'm feeling horrible. There, there'd be no, there'd be no, there'd be no line, like uh, sense to the conversation. It'd be just me saying, I'm sorry, you know, you. Forgiveness, forgiveness and trust are such slow um, things to earn that uh, it's like I I want to like I was I wanted to make sure like I just wanted to call them and make sure that they would uh, well I was I was fearful that I would be abandoned you know so you all love and support Michael Unreservedly. Definitely. Mm -hmm. But but but, uh, and now it's turned to the fact that that I've come to realize that uh, my immediate family are are my uh, they're for for some unknown reason they've stuck by me so. The question of how we could forgive um, someone like Michael is, is, a, is a classic example of blaming the victim. Seems like such an obvious analogy, but you don't forgive someone for contracting their cancer. M Mom, unfortunately, lost her life, um, but it's important to to keep in mind that, that there are two victims in this story, and one of them happens to still be suffering. Um, um, Michael survived the, um, the, the terrible event, um, but he, he continues to suffer. It seemed like the, the, the positive memories and the negative memories both caused me pain. Because look, look, what, I, look what I've done, it's, I, I've not, I've impacted so many, like, I'm, I've impacted this network of people. I think that in at the loss of, with with the loss with the loss of a loved one, um, uh, with an with an act of unthinkable violence such as this, we 
our instinct is to is to look for look for the fault, look for the cause of it. Um, but we make a, a terrible mistake to think that that cause rests with Michael himself. Um, the, the cause of this tragedy is a, is a mental disease. It's a mistake to to say that Michael was himself her killer. I mean, her killer was schizophrenia. The cause of her death was this disease. I, I'm not able to grieve the way I'd like to. I have a, I have a, I have some grief, but it's not, uh, it's not, uh, uh, a feel good grief, which I imagine, uh, cause, I, from what I know, uh, I've, from what I know, some people grieve, gr grieve loved ones with fond memories, <laughs> whereas I'm not. I'll just say this, this is, I'm grieving, <laughs> like it's like if I grieve, I kind of, I, unless, oh, there are, odd moments that contradict this, or not odd, but spare, occasional moments that contradict this, but for the most part, I grieve alone. I'm not in Brockville Mental Health Center anymore and being out of a hospital and being out of uh, an institution when you've been institutionalized is actually pretty difficult because you're always used to having somebody around. So when you're alone, you're like, where is everybody? Well, there's lots of upsides. There's friends, family, being free. You know, I can have a drink if I want. I can smoke a joint. I can, you know, I can do what I want. Carol, I understand you have a big surprise for us today. <laughs> yeah, well, I got new teeth, tops and bottoms. Wow, wow, that looks really great. Thank you. Congratulations. I feel like a million bucks. Okay. Can you take the most? <laughs> Miss Vike, what big teeth you have. <laughs> okay. Yeah, oh, very good. Have people noticed? Oh, yeah, everyone's noticed. What are they saying to you? They're saying I look great. There's little tiny little pieces of that pill. There's little pieces of that pill. Okay. Your bus up here, they're cute. Oh, huh. Don't, don't stir that in here. What's the one that kills you? When you Jill. What's your... What's the one that kills I guess the bottom line is I'm out of the hospital, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy that, that uh, I've got this far and this is my uh, my apartment. I'm living here 
with another guy and uh, it's I'm still getting used to it but it's that's where I'm standing now from two or three days after I got here I'm, I'm happy I made the step So you've made strides then, initial strides to, you know, to get out here in the community and make a life here in Brockville. For sure, it's uh, like I, I'm, I try to I try to keep busy. Well, what's your your diagnosis of schizophrenia? Um, <laughs> or just plain think, nuts? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, and now that I'm here, it's it's like I. At some point, I'm starting to get optimistic about um, maybe uh, at one point getting, making it further steps. But I, the idea is to kind of take it, take it uh, somewhat slowly. What what medication do you take? Yeah, I take uh, I take twice a day. I take medication, right? Yeah, and you find it helps. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Otherwise you'd be pretty goofy at <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. <laughs>